Welcome, everybody. Um, this is the, as we're nearing the end of the semester, almost our final event. Um, this is the elements of border and infrastructure. This is air number two. Um, and just to plug the event we have next week, our final event in the series on fire, which we'll be focusing in the GCC. Um, again, real quick, this is a series still in this Zoom moment trying to um, you know, use this metaphoric, playful, expansive idea of the elements, fire, water, air, and earth, to think about time, space, geography, disciplines in a different way by bringing together scholars and practitioners on Zoom in a conversational way. So today we have air. And um, I just wanted to quote from uh, the, the abstract that we wrote, Tim Ingold, an anthropologist uh, that uh, you know, we put in the, this abstract that air is, quote, not so much what we perceive, but what we perceive in. And so we have three scholars here that will be thinking about um, air as a medium of exchange, of movement um, in very different locations. And so just by way of how we'll be moving forward, everybody will, the, the three guests will have roughly 10 minutes to kind of offer some thoughts, put, um, uh, you know, their project, some part of their project on the table. Um, that will be roughly half an hour. Then we'll move to uh, some questions between all of us. Um, that will be half an hour, and then it will open up to the public um, for you guys to unmute yourself. We wanted to encourage you also, if you have any questions as this goes along, just feel free to put those in the chat. Um, we'll get to them. And we like to think of this as um, more of a kind of an informal conversation, especially as the semester goes on, the flake rate goes down, we're a smaller group. So um, we hope that everyone will stick around and also have questions at the end. So um, we will be putting the full bios of the speakers in the chat, but appearing in the, uh, the, in, in the order of, of how they'll be coming, we have Gokche Gunad, Walid Husbun, and Andrea Stanton. And so with that, Gokche, I will turn it over to you to get us started on air. Thank you so much for uh, having me and uh, putting this together. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about a little bit about air. So um, uh, Jim is going to be sharing slides for me. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, so I, my name is Gök Çegünel and I am uh, an assistant professor in the anthropology department at Rice University. And um, so can So um, if you could show the next page, please. Thank you. So in my book, Spaceship in the Desert, I studied the construction of a smart eco city called Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi. And so today I'm going to share some brief thoughts on air conditioning, which emerged from this uh, research. Next, please. So throughout my uh, fieldwork uh, at Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi in 2010 and 2011, I attended meetings with uh, architects and energy efficiency engineers to discuss how and when Mazdar Institute's building management system would be completed. Mazdar Institute was an energy focused research center. It was set up and supervised by uh, MIT at Mazdar City. And during my uh, research there, the, this, this building, the, which was designed by uh, Foster and Partners, was the only operational structures, structure at the Mazdar city site. And it provided classrooms, laboratories, office space, and dormitories for Mazdar Institute students and faculty. And uh, in the image here, you can see this is from the sort of the, uh, the first few weeks uh, of Mazdar Institute's opening. So this is, you can see the sort of student staff and faculty posing in front of the Mazdar Institute building here. Um, so about, 100 students lived at Mazdar Institute during this time, and uh, they were uh, very important interlocutors for my research, as you can imagine. Next slide, please. Rowan Moore was an architecture critic at the, at the Observer, uh, who had reviewed the Mazdar Institute building at the time of its opening. Um, 
refer to the building management system uh, of Mazdar Institute as its hidden brain. So building management systems are actually very common technological systems that have been implemented in large buildings since the 1960s. And their purpose is mostly to control the building's indoor environment. And due to the decreasing price of the hardware required for their manufacturing, these systems became uh, widespread during the 1970s. But the smart BMS at Mazdar Institute differentiated itself from uh, these previous forms of uh, building management systems and it was intended to remain outside the conscious awareness of its residents while having a decisive effect on how they live. So perhaps the analogy of the hidden brain was not so misplaced in this sense. So the implementation of the desired building management system would breathe life, life into the Mazdar Institute building and it would augment its capacities for uh, automation and control. It would not only contribute to the centralization of decision-making power and facilitate the dominance of an optimization logic within the buildings and buildings environment, it would actually prohibit occupants from interfering with the system as much as they would like to. So unless the occupants match the profile determined by the uh, building management systems control panel, they would have to come to terms with the discomforts of the building's environment. So the BMS control panel on the Mazdar Institute campus would engineer new subject subjective senses of comfort for the building's occupants. And it would stress, and I guess this is important to um, foreground that it would stress that, that this new sensibility would in turn have planetary effects. It would help humanity battle environmental problems. So the discomfort actually had a very clear um, benefit uh, and at a sort of a global level. Uh, in the case of Mazdar, the discomforts of the building's environment would translate into a broader climate change mitigation strategy, which would not only decrease the energy demands of the building, but also dictate certain types of behavior for the building's residents. Next slide, please. So here you can see an image of the Mazdar Institute labs. Uh, and I'm showing this image mainly to say that the building's temperature had been a topic of heated debate on the Mazdar Institute campus in spaces like this one. So Brad, which, who was an executive from Mazdar City, whom I interviewed many times on the Mazdar Institute campus, offered a lengthy explanation saying at one point that temperature and air conditioning change your mood when you're in a building, but people have different senses of temperature. Would you like to inhabit a room that's 23, 24, or 26 degrees Celsius? Some on-site architects working with Foster and Partners summed up the discussion on temperature as one occurring between the Emiratis and the non-Emiratis. So according to them, the Emirati students had become used to occupying buildings that remained firmly set to 21 degrees Celsius or even less. Don't you freeze when you go to the shopping malls in this country? Uh, Daniel, uh, the German architect who worked with Foster and Partners asked me. So proposing uh, temperature as a matter of cultural concern. However, stabilizing the temperature at the desired 21 degrees Celsius level would increase Mazdar Institute's uh, energy demand significantly. So the architects knew that the temperature would be somewhere between 21 and 26 degrees. And later, after weeks of deliberation and discussion, one on-site architect noted, noted to me that they had settled on 24 degrees Celsius. This decision upset some of the occupants that they, they acknowledged, but it was implemented anyway. One Foster and Partners architect added that the sustainability that was their goal did not allow for flexibility. It's not possible to have both at the same time, he underlined. Next slide, please. Martin Potter, who was the facilities manager of Mazdar Institute, also wanted to make sure that sustainability would not be compromised uh, at Mazdar City, even if this would require surrendering flexibility. So according to him, this would be the future of energy management in the United States and Europe as well. Uh, the article that you see here in this image, the, which is titled Mazdar City, the world's greenest city, uh, the world's greenest city can it work, um, assessed Potter's position. So the next slide, please. Martin Potter, Mazdar's director of operations and facilities, noted that most Abu Dhabi citizens are used to keeping their air conditioning as low as 60, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. It helps that electricity is heavily subsidized. But in Mazdar, AC needs to be set closer to 77 degrees Fahrenheit to keep within its efficiency targets. With the ability to, to monitor exactly how much electricity every room in the city is using, Potter can keep citizens in line. It's name and shame, he says. I'm a green policeman. Next one, 
In another uh, article, uh, which again assessed sort of uh, Mazdar Institute's capacities, uh, which you see here in this image, Mazdar City, a glimpse of the future in the desert, uh, Potter again was quoted. Next slide, please. Here, residents live with driverless electric cars, shaded streets cooled by a huge wind tower and a Big Brother style green policeman monitoring their energy use. The city is a laboratory for the future, says Martin Potter, director of operations at the Institute and dubbed the green policeman. The big brother approach to cutting energy is likely to become the norm as computerized smart grids are rolled out in Europe and the US, he adds. I want to know exactly how these buildings work. I can pinpoint who's using the most energy and water, whether in an apartment or the academy. Certain students have been used to having their conditioning on at 16 degrees Celsius. Here it is 24 degrees Celsius. Yes, they complain, but I've told them that that's how it is. Next one, please. When I asked Brad, the executive from Azar City, what he thought about these ongoing complaints from the building residents, he responded, but that's exactly why we have to implement dummy controls. He laid out how dummy controls would work for residents. You get up and change the environment psychologically, and that saves so much energy. Karim, a young energy efficiency engineer, also argued that occupants would be more satisfied with their living situations if they believed they could change a room's temperature, even if in reality they could not. He lightly referred to a study in China in which engineers had implemented dummy thermostats in rooms in response to repeated protests by residents of an office block regarding their lack of self-control. The dummy thermostats made everyone much happier, Karim reported. In the industry, this placebo effect was argued to provide the illusion of control to tenants without compromising on the system's efficiency. At Mazdar Institute, the hidden brain of the building would serve as a discrete sense-making apparatus. And in her book on the emergence of sick building syndrome, historian of science Michelle Murphy touches upon such sense-making capacities and proposes the concept of regimes of perceptibility to describe the ways in which certain phenomenological conditions become blocked while others accentuated. So, and this, create, this helps create a definitive methodology for the building occupant to relate to their environment. So in the China example offered by Kirim, the dummy thermostats had served as a material manifestation of the desired regime of perceptibility within Mazdar Institute. If they were implemented, the subjects who privilege sight over thermoception would easily be manipulated into believing that their environment had been improved when in fact, the thermostat remained fixed at a predetermined temperature. The building's machinery would work in what we might call a deceptive manner. Next one, please. Yet Brad did not think this was troubling. The individuals inhabiting the building would be led to consume less energy and thereby contribute to a higher good. They would be doing so rather unknowingly, but Brad argued that this would be beside the point. For him, dummy thermostats and the imperceptibility produced through them seemed like an ideal scenario for the time being until consumers became more aware of the urgency of energy conservation and efficiency. Brad did not talk about how building occupants would become more aware of their consumption if they were consistently manipulated by a technological infrastructure. But tech cities may begin to use even more resources, and in this way, Mazdar could be part of the paradox, Brad then pointed out. This place looks like star tech, but maybe ecological places must be low tech passive houses. Here we go high tech and we pay for efficiency, but that may not work either, he added. Next one, please. For now, an energy efficiency engineer confirmed there were no thermostats in the rooms at Mazda Institute. At one of the regular BMS meetings, which took place in a, a room in the, inside the makeshift and provisional offices of Mazdar City, it was noted that the absences of the thermostat prevented Mazdar Institute residents from tinkering with central environmental conditions dictated by the half-working BMS. Two Mazdar Institute students who attended the meetings as research assistants shyly provided some feedback to the other nine participants underlining that their rooms, beautiful and spacious in design, were mostly cold and uncomfortable. The students' complaints were logged. The energy efficiency engineers working with Mazdar City promised the building would soon be improved. Next one, please. You guys are learning how to use controls. We need a booklet on how all the systems work. It's weird that you never get a how to use book for buildings, Daniel, the Fostran Partners architect, announced during an on-campus presentation uh, in November 2010. 
The presentation targeted the students who had moved into the dorms only two months ago and would help them figure things out. The BMS system is not functioning properly, he said, and BMS runs this building like a ship. And when you don't maintain the BMS system, then you don't run the sh ship properly. Imagine the BMS as the management unit of the ship, he emphasized. The ship, a life supporting environment amid an ocean where human life is consist constantly in danger, was put at risk due to the malfunctioning BMS. But the ship, or what many at Mazda refer to as the spaceship in the desert, would soon be improved with students' cooperation. The last slide, please. So thank you so much for listening. Gokche, thank you for that. Um, moving on to Andrea. Sorry, I'm so perplexed by the order. Uh, for some reason, I thought we were going alphabetically. Uh, let me just pull this up. <clears throat> okay, we are also definitely not um, going in chronological uh, order. So we're gonna jump back in time with me for a little bit. Um, uh, can I just ask, are my um, slides visible? Yes. Yes, great. Okay, so first, thank you so much. I really love this series, um, and I feel super honored and also slightly like an imposter uh, being part of it. Um, but I just really appreciate the fact of the series and being able to be part of it. Um, and I'm going to focus my comments today on radio and mandate Palestine. Um, but I think a lot of what I say is fairly transferable. So not only to other radio uh, studies, but also to studies of sound, technology, um, politics, and society uh, more broadly. So if you're not as into radio as I am, then hopefully you'll find some stuff to distill out. Um, and my research starts in the 1930s. Um, and in fact, fun fact, uh, 86 years ago today, um, March 30th, 1936, was when the P Palestine Broadcasting Service began broadcasting on air. Um, and it came into a very interesting moment, not only politically for Mandate Palestine, but also um, really interesting in terms of radio broadcasting history. And I like to think of it as I put here as the kind of moment that's after newness, um, but before uh, radio kind of faded into a background invisibility. And so I think of this time period as a few decades after the kind of utopian vision that radio was gonna do everything um, and shifting to much more utilitarian often um, uh, government driven goals. Uh, it was also a shift from kind of promoting radio sets as just a marvel uh, to thinking about selling the benefit in terms of how it would improve somebody's uh, quality of life, either in a domestic setting or in a workplace setting. Um, and also on a receiving end, it was a shift from, again, like rejoicing just in the fact of hearing sound uh, coming from this thing to starting to critique the quality of the sound and the quality of the programming. Um, and then a corollary with that shifting from, again, this kind of delight of tuning up and down the dial and just finding something to listen to, to really choosing stations based on their language, their political or social outlook, and their programming. Um, and then if you look at the photos, uh, there's a, this is also kind of the era, if we think about infrastructure, uh, for end users, really, on the listener end, the main infrastructure visible to them was the radio set. Technically, it's called a radio receiving set. Uh, but there's obviously a lot of broadcasting infrastructure as well, um, although that tended to be concentrated um, in, uh, in this case, in buildings by the transmitter, which was out in Ramallah. So these photos are from inside the, the buildings there and were from the, the engineering side of the station. I think they're super fun. Um, but for people who are in Ramallah or who are traveling nearby, the most visible infrastructure were the, the masts, the big transmitter towers. Um, and these photos are just some of a series taken in 1937. They're not all of them. They're not even half of them. They're just some. Um, and I think it's a, a nice reminder. There's quite a lot of photos of transmitters taken in the first half of the 20th century. It's kind of a visual obsession um, of kind of, you know, a certain kind of modernity made visible. They're really beautiful, um, but they're also kind of hard to photograph, which I think also comes through in this selection. There's some great, beautiful photos, and then there's some kind of awkward trying to do something interesting with transmitters. Um, that's happening in the selection of photos. So um, we've got the big kind of hyper visual 
um, hyper visible infrastructure on the broadcasting side. And then this kind of big for this moment in time infrastructure, which is the radio sets on the receiving side. And so here again, this is just kind of a sample of 1930s and 1940s radios. You'll notice most are wood. Um, there's some that start to turn to a kind of manufactured substance called Bakelite uh, in the 1940s. They're pretty big, they're pretty noticeable, and they're also not just pretty. Um, there's, they're objects to notice, uh, to look at, uh, as well as to listen with, right? So again, they're, they're not new new, they're kind of new, uh, and they're not yet invisible. Uh, many operated with electricity, um, Many money operated via battery, which made them more versatile as technologies for um, technological objects for homes or workplaces with or without electric current. Um, and in terms of infrastructure, these are quite separate from the transmitters. Um, they're quite separate from the engineering. They're actually uh, not totally invisible because in the 1930s, most had what were called aerials, like a wire or a um, a uh, wire encased in something that had to be uh, put up on a building outside. So it was more easy to tell on the outside. You might think of it as like the equivalent of a satellite dish today. So easier to see on the outside of a building who might have a radio on the inside. Um, but they're, they're quite separate from the broadcasting side of infrastructure, uh, but they worked together with major impacts on daily life um, in similarly kind of noticeable, but also unnoticeable ways. Um, and then like the infrastructure, Broadcasting technology is really intertwined with others. Um, and I think we could talk about the world, I could talk and bore you all about the world of modern mechanical sounds more broadly. But here I think it's helpful just to kind of think about radio as really taking hold in what people call the electrical era, which came after the acoustic era, um, which started in 1925. So radio without amplification technologies or recording technologies would have been very, very different um, and likely less impactful because the cost of live music um, would have been prohibited compared to the records that um, I put a sample of, and because the range of sounds hearable would also have been extremely constrained. So I just put here, um, there aren't really just only two sets of questions related to hearing, listening, and broadcasting. There's probably more like a hundred or hundreds of sets of questions, uh, but these are the ones I find both foundational and particularly helpful. Um, first in helping us get a grasp on what broadcasting, hearing, and listening was actually like at different moments historically. And second in helping us begin to assess their impacts at the time and also over the longer run of time um, since the 1930s. I'm not going to try to answer them all today. I'm just throwing them up there uh, in, a, in a conversational spirit. Uh, this is a really ugly slide, um, and I apologize for that, um, but it's also a really important visual. It's a close-up of the tuning dial of a 1938 Marconi radio gramophone, so that kind of technological combo, and if you're either able to zoom in or you have amazing eyesight, uh, you can see the wide range of stations that were presented as available to the listener on air, and I think you can also get a sense that that semi-vertical line is the tuning dial, and so you can get a sense of how imprecise tuning could be. Uh, the creation of stations and the assigning of frequencies is I think just an, another curious way that space and place get rearranged with radio. It's not just that a person could tune into live broadcasts from across the Mediterranean, but also that the stations that were near each other on the dial were not necessarily near one another geographically. And then below the dial is a list of stations available to listeners in Palestine as of June 1938. And I'm basing that on program guides that were published in various newspapers and some government documents. And it's, I think there's a few that are missing, right? Like people could hear US stations every so often and the station in Beirut had just begun test broadcast. But I think it gives a kind of rough sense of the oral picture of broadcast sounds available at the time. So listeners could tune into many stations or alternatively those wishing to tune into one particular station might have to deal with overlapping frequencies and broadcasting interference. Um, but their access to an interest in any particular station was also kind of interpolated by language. Um, so these are broadcasting in a whole range of languages. Um, and I think that this points back to some of the questions that I put on the previous slide because political folks, including some broadcasters, tended to think about people tuning in for news and talks. News was certainly important, especially in crisis moments, but it's not clear that it was always the driver, right? That people tuned into stations sometimes when they understood the language of broadcasting and sometimes when they did not. Um, so what was that stuff vibrating its way through the ether? Um, I ordered this list by category um, by the percentage of on-air time. And so I'm saying that the largest percentage of on-air time was actually silent, static, or interference. Um, and then I've kind of uh, added in some quotes from memoirs or diaries where I have them. 
Uh, music was the second most in terms of time on air. Then there were talks, educational talks, uh, historical talks, all kinds of things. Plays, stories, and poetry. I actually didn't unfortunately have a great quote for that, but there's a lot of really great stuff uh, um, in the kind of cultural uh, side of programming. And then on the, the further down in terms of less um, broadcasting time, children's programming, and then news uh, and uh, different kinds of prices for things, commodities prices is in, on some stations, and then weather. News, again, is super critical during crises, tightly controlled by different stations, um, and just the tiniest fraction of broadcasting time, uh, in large part because um, of the concern that, that news was so, uh, was so likely to um, uh, pr provoke responses in listeners. So then just to stay on time, I'll just switch to slip shift to my concluding thoughts. And I've got two that are, again, pretty specific to what I do, and then two that are more general. Um, and the first two, I think it's helpful for me as a reminder or as an argument that I think radio broadcasting really is worth studying in its own right um, for the specific constellation of affordances and impacts that it offers. Um, and I think these two points signal the agency of each set of or each group of folks on the broadcasting side and on the listening side, but also that they weren't always in tune with one another, that there were often quite large gaps between what political officers and broadcasters imagined listeners doing and, and thinking while listening and after listening, um, and then what listeners actually did and thought and said while listening and after listening. Um, and then the, the final two points, I think, are again a reminder that for me, this is um, uh, radio is also really useful studying as a transferable case study um, with analytical insights that I think can be useful to those working in a whole range of cognates fields. Um, so the more airy, the less airy, the more historical and the less historical. So I'll close there uh, so we can turn on to the lead. Thank you, Andrea. That was great. And I have to apologize. I skipped over the order that we had to you over Walid. So we'll, we'll double back. Okay, um, thanks. Um, it's great to be here. I'm really excited to be part of this Elements of uh, Border and Infrastructure series on air. For a while, I've been interested in the politics of air mobility. I, don't know if this, I, can, give, I can illustrate my, my uh, talk this way. Um, by the end of the 20th century, air travel became a defining aspect of modern culture, impacting diplomacy and commerce, tourism, obviously, but also the, the dynamics of diaspora communities, how we understand the meaning of places, cultures, and cosmopolitanism, and even the life and work of academics. Air travel allowed me to pretend there might be many uh, consistencies in my academic life as I relocated from Beirut to Alabama. But what in fact has allowed me to maintain global engagements has been the rise of virtual events like this one. So while I've been trying to work on the topic of the politics of aero mobility over the past few years, we have entered what seems to me a critical phase during which first air travel had become so common, affordable and ubiquitous from the spread of low cost airlines across North America and Europe, but also in Asia and even into the Middle East, combined with the rapid expansion of long haul super connecting airlines based in the Gulf, Turkey and elsewhere. Um, but in the process of these changes, something else has arisen. Many have begun to consider the notion, once thought to be dystopian by many, utopian by others, of life without air travel. Is it even possible? What would that mean? Such concerns begun with the awareness of the rapidly expanding carbon footprint of air travel and questions about mobility justice. Um, but now we are still processing this massive unexpected experience of nearly halting our air travel over a year and doing away with uh, many of the needs for air travel by replacing in-person events with virtual ones like this. I think we're now in a moment, and it might not last that long, uh, with some space to reassess what sort of future relations with air travel we wanna have. So be before be coming back to this question, I wanna briefly review some uh, reflections about the transformations of the experience of air travel. In the mid 20th century, as Jennifer Van Vleck explains, the expansion of global aviation or civilian air travel was deeply connected with the expansion of US global power and the US dominated liberal economic order. Aviation was the lens through which Americans could visualize and see their global power and imagine a sort of global dominance through its quote, empire of the air. Now by the 1980s, aviation became part of a volatile neoliberal order. Um, it faced disruptions from oil price spikes and hijackings and the interest in the industry became globalized 
based on a network of international airlines that was no longer dominated by just US firms. With the end of the Cold War, though, in the, into the 1990s, air travel became the ubiquitous vehicle for, um, for much of what we call globalization. Uh, while the expansion of container shipping might be more central to the material and economic aspects of globalization, I think airports and air travel were understood as the icons of the era and, and defined what we thought of as the experience of globalization based on extreme forms of global mobility and global connection. Sociologist Mark Gardiner wrote a book called Life in the Air based on his experience of living a bi-coastal life, witnessing the experience of deterritorialization in which identities and cultures um, became unrooted from fixed locations. Now, while this uh, September 11th tax shut down air travel and US airlines struggled for a couple of years, um, we've, uh, and we've since experienced a new level of securitization of air travel and suffer much from the security theater of TSA checkpoints. Looking back, it seems that into the 2000s, air travel became an everyday American experience. And soon with the assistance of Gulf Airlines and low cost airlines in Asia and elsewhere, uh, more accessibly glo globally. One of the best chroniclers of this era is English professor, cultural critic, and one-time ground crew staff member at Bozeman Airport in Montana, Christopher Schaberg, um, who through a series of books has investigated the everyday uh, experiences, material features, and cultural representations of airports and air travel. He reflects on interesting paradoxes, uh, how the activity of super fast jet flight central to air mobility for the traveler is mostly sitting around motionless in a small seat, suffering weather delays or standing in line. He also notes how technologies like mobile phones have transformed the experience of the airport and flight um, and have become the kind of the medium of air travel. Everybody's kind of watching their phones. That's much of the experience of being in an airport or an airplane these days. Uh, nevertheless, Schaubrick never tires in his efforts to, to um, observe every detail of the airport and flight experience. And for me, one of the most exciting recent interventions that can inspire, I think, a rethinking of the experience of flight has been from the failed PhD uh, history student, Mark Van Honacker, uh, who became a pilot on long haul flights for British Airways and now a successful author who writes beautifully about airplanes and air travel in a way that I find re-enchants the experience. His book called Skyfaring, uh, um, it offers a, the perspective of a pilot. It recounts how pilots navigate their route with waypoint locations and through radio communications, which is you know, still central to air travel. The radio has long been you know, a, a critical feature and you could, you know, we could talk more about that. Um, he also explains how pilots get, uh, don't get jet lag so much because they, their sleep rhythms are, are suited to their work schedule and they, which includes sleeping on long haul flights and things like that. But instead they tend to get place lag as their sense of place gets scrambled as they spend time in different locations. What's really wonderful about the book is how it explores the materiality of flight. He reminds one of the technology of flight, that the plane is a machine and how it navigates changing air pressure and how uh, planes cross over water across vast seas, but also fly through the water of clouds. Most travelers these days, I think really fail to think about flight in these ways. One thing I learned from the early depictions of air flight is how airlines long sought to get travelers not to think of air travel as flight, uh, um, but like creating interiors of planes that look like living rooms and offering entertainment in the sense like a kind of sort of more of a, um, a domestic environment. Uh, they were concerned about the fear of flying and making passengers feel safe. Um, uh, so, you know, after reading uh, uh, Skyfaring, I think, you know, once you start thinking about turbulence and understanding more about it, you come to think of rust chop more like the experience of a speedboat ride at 3,000 feet rather than uh, uh, somehow a, a feeling of insecurity. But now I want to switch from enchantment to gloom. Um, we cannot think about aviation without considering climate change. Just before the pandemic hit, commercial aviation was calculated to contribute a few percent of total global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, while a small percent, this share was growing and expected to rise rapidly with expanding global air travel. Um, but in this case, even just a small percentage represents a disproportionate share of, of activity in the people that are involved in it. Some suggest that if left unchecked, air travel could consume up to maybe a quarter of the available carbon budget 
if we really did want to limit climate change to uh, one and a half degrees centigrade. Meanwhile, within the global uh, um, movement against climate change, there's been growing activism against the expansion of air travel, against airport runway expansion, and even a movement sometimes referred to as flight shaming. If we're going to take seriously the challenge of climate change, we need to rethink aviation and air travel um, and, and, and be part of that effort. So keeping in mind these ex, uh, environmental concerns, um, I just want to end more broadly by posing the question of if and how we might rethink the centrality of aeromobility. Living in the middle of nowhere here in Alabama, has given me new perspectives on place and distance. I clearly value my global connections, but it's also exposed me to differential mobilities. I've more than once stood in line or boarded a flight in Birmingham, Alabama with a middle-aged person who was going on a plane for the first time. Now, while I don't have an answers or even really a suggestion for the future of travel, I think it's, it's important to consider the profound implications of whatever direction uh, we choose, more travel, less travel, um, it's something to think, I think, uh, um, to think about and have discussions about within different contexts, including, let's say, within academia and within other circles. So thank you. Thank you, Walid. We're going to all come together into a larger Hollywood square here. Thank you, everybody, for um, your comments, the different places, uh, times we're at. Um, this is, I think, what's really lovely and also difficult about these events, um, especially with something as, dare I say, slippery, evasive, invisible as air. Um, and so I wanted to maybe just start with a question. Um, and I think some of you maybe were, were starting to do this. I was thinking about, you know, these, um, you know, this, I, this feeling with the air and thermodynamics and comfort the listening or the perceptibility of, of the radio, of how it, it's transferred, and will lead everything you're talking about with movement and mobility. Um, and I was just wondering if you guys from your Reese, from your much larger research and books, might highlight an instance of people's changing conceptions or government regulations or a kind of private to public speed bump of where the air becomes a central kind of uh, friction point where maybe the law, the regulation, the conception of what this thing is perhaps becomes um, in flux or changes. And so this is just a, you know, a, a, a broad question of you know, maybe pulling back to the medium itself. And if in your different research, you have something that maybe kind of highlights that individually. And this is also the anthropologist in me who loves an, an, an ethnographic moment. And that's open for, for anyone, yeah. So I can talk a little bit, um, I'm not sure this is my research, I feel like it's background stuff, uh, but in, in terms of radio broadcasting, uh, the, the major friction point um, comes and it has to do with the, the geography of Europe, which turns out to include um, the Soviet Union and everything south of the Mediterranean, um, it comes with interference, right? So um, most stations in the late 20s, early 30s are broadcasting on what we today think of as AM radio, uh, just to shorthand it, it's, it's, a, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's essentially it. Um, and those waves are medium waves, again, to shorthand things a little bit, uh, and so they they go fairly far. Um, and so um, there are a number of conferences. The most the one that I interact with most is the Lucerne Conference of uh, 1933, in which different um, primarily European countries get together and agree to essentially self handicap themselves by staying on certain frequencies um, for the one or two or <clears throat> number of of, of medium wave stations that, uh, and then short wave stations that they will operate. Um, and they do that because they're, they get really grouchy about what they call crowded airwaves. Um, and they particularly don't want 
other countries, non-friendly countries, especially uh, to be broadcasting on frequencies that their listeners might might be hearing. Um, so it becomes a point of regulation. And because it's also a colonial moment uh, and because stations south of the Mediterranean and stations north, north of the Mediterranean also have interference across, then the European broadcasting zone ends up being defined as including the whole south part of the Mediterranean through Turkey. Um, but it also um, therefore means that it's uh, colonial officials, right? It's like British officials speaking on behalf of Palestine, it's French officials speaking on behalf of Lebanon and Syria. Um, and so it air does really become a friction point as broadcasting capacities become strong enough to create uh, political and social anxieties um, of listeners, not simply listening across national borders, but listening on stations that uh, are not that the, the state is not able to secure uh, as only operating on that frequency. Um, anyway, that ends up becoming later um, the International Telecommunications Union and fun fact also uh, becomes the grounds for who participates in um, the European singing competition that I am totally blanking on the name of uh, today. So tying, yes, exactly. So it ends up tying all into that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure also as transistors, you know, become stronger and disperse more. Thank you. That's a great example. Walid Gokchid, okay. you have. Um... I'll, I'll, um, I mean, the, the first thing that I thought of is, is probably not is not ethnographic, but is the idea of like airspace and and um, and, uh, you know, the agreement, the Chicago Convention that allows uh, flights to go through different national airspaces. Um, and then, you know, during the Cold War, there's, you know, divisions, but then since the end of the Cold War, you, you're having this kind of interesting dynamics of the geopolitics of space of where flights do and do not fly to, and some of that's relating to insurance, and some of that's relating to, to, um, uh, to military issues, and, you know, the U.S. and the Soviet Union had an agreement previously of open skies in the sense that allowed overflights for, you know, um, monitoring purposes, so, um, but I was thinking in terms of, you um, uh, two things, and, and each of them connect, I think, to my other panelists. One is the pressurization of air cabins, which is not something I've studied in detail, but you can get this, the, 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 um, the ability of jet travel by pressurizing cabins allowed more comfortable flight experiences. And so there's a kind of history to that um, that I think transforms the experience of flight, allowing for that more, making it more that domestic kind of space. Um, the second thing is relates to sound. Um, I think about the, you know, the, we had supersonic flight for a while, but wasn't commercially viable. And there's some talk of that, but the idea of, of the Concorde and things like that. But the other thing that was related to that and also limits travel is the sound of, of aircraft. And much of the, the issues of the politics of, of airports relates to the, the sound of overflights um, and the, the, the politics around uh, Heathrow expansion and other expansions. So I think uh, we don't always think about aircraft in terms of their sound because in flight you don't hear the outside, but it's a big part of the the, say, the geography of, of airport development relates to the sound and the sound corridors and, and how to mitigate that and, and things like that. That's great. And I, I feel like in the news, I just saw that uh, in Qatar, the airspace was just expanded and it was being lauded as some sort of a uh, by Qatar Airways, at least, as you know, an advancement. Go did you have? Um... Sure, I can uh, say something, and I think it, uh, in some ways, I think it echoes uh, uh, Walid's and Andrea's comments as well, in the sense that it is a, a tension that's um, mainly about scale. Um, so, in the uh, in the piece that I sort of shared, uh, I think the the main tension that's about air is about how to set air conditioning. What sh what temperature should air con what purpose should air conditioning serve, and should it provide comfort to all individually based on their demands, or should there be a sort of like a unified system that's not uh, flexible but that serves um, a higher good? Um, and so. Um, the the and I write about this more extensively in 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 the book. But the the this kind of this debate uh, that I talked about briefly transforms into a transformed into a larger debate at Mustar, which was about sort of uh, whether 
um, we should comply with the logics of a technocratic dictatorship and why we would choose to do that. And so some of the people who were working on the projects that I shared uh, uh, called the, labeled their own projects technocratic dictatorships uh, that, that follow the very sort of a um, um, very strict logic from their perspectives. And, and, but then they legitimized that logic by arguing that this was the only way to mitigate climate change and that if uh, these sacrifices were not made by the individuals, then there would be, um, you know, that, that, that there would be a more significant consequences. So the, the trade-off is always positioned as this kind of uh, trade-off between the sort of the um, climate change mitigation at the global scale and the sort of the individual's uh, very specific sort of uh, um, capacity to choose uh, how they want to live. And so, uh, and and in that in that choice, uh, the the even though they saw the sort of the um, the, the what they again the, what they call the dictatorship tendencies within a regime of governance of this kind, uh, they the the engineers and scientists I worked with always said yes we have to have a technocratic dictatorship, and and again. I think the the abstraction there is really important. I think to think about that that abstraction of of serving a higher good uh, becomes a sort of the legitimizing logic for different kinds of uh, uh, different systems of oppression. And I think this is just one example that can be sort of replicated in other kinds of settings and other kinds of ways. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how. I mean, if you want to sort of push the sort of the 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 sort of the elemental quality of this example, I guess you could say that air is for for whom in this case is the air for the sort of the individual residents of this co community who want to access sort of very specific uh, temperature conditions and very specific uh, levels of comfort, or is air for uh, for everyone for the globe and so for for all of us to sort of inhabit in a sort of a in a um, in a sort of a livable way, I guess, yeah. And I see so a question on the chat uh, asking if this community that I described still exists. So Mazdar Institute uh, was closed, uh, and it, and so in now in this building that I described, um, uh, there is a different research center. Um, uh, called Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence, uh, and it is not it has partnerships with uh, Chinese universities and its main function um, or main focus is no longer renewable energy and clean technology but instead artificial intelligence surveillance technologies and machine learning. Gocha, thank you for that. I mean it, it's also I think what you signaled in the in the end there a really interesting question of not just you know what we can experience, what we can be in, what we have access to, and and for whom, and so it's interesting what Andrea just mentioned of you know maybe in this kind of air alliance of countries limiting the reach, right? Even though we might not know about that or necessarily perceive it, and even your example of this thermostat, right? I mean, it almost it makes it it's like a Black Mirror episode where you're you know you're trapped and you can't even adjust the. The, the temperature and it becomes like a, a mind game there. And so this idea of, you know, the regulations, the decisions that are being made behind the scene through which, uh, you know, they, they move on this medium in, as you guys talk about in, in, in such different ways. Um, just, uh, we will be coming to uh, Q and A with the public and you guys will be able to unmute yourselves. If you have a, a question, I see Karen, um, Karen has a comment. Yes, we are in this COVID moment, all clearly all around the world. And it's one of the, the good things about this, but we hope to also have events back um, in person. Um, so while everyone is, uh, again, hopefully thinking about a question, you can just raise your hand and, and, and we can come to you. Um, I, I guess this might be a difficult question the way that uh, you know, science technology studies, uh, technology broadly kind of intersect what you guys are, are working on. And you know, I, I guess I was, as you were all talking, I was thinking about the devices that we have 
that mediate um, our connections here. And so Andrea, you had a, these, these great examples of, of the early radios. Walid, you know, I think I, I was thinking about your description of the, the airports, the, the airplanes. And so I was wondering if, if you might say something more about just kind of this mediation through the, the devices. I think Walid and I are going to wait one another out on this, but I will <laughs> I will unmute myself. Um, I think it's actually a really interesting question, uh, and I think so. Um, when I get together with other radio historians, we we do kind of like to ruminate on the challenges of listening uh, and thinking that uh, we can somehow access past listening, right? So even when we have like recordings of old programs, for example, like do you have them with the static that people would have heard? Do you hear that? Do you have them with the like family context or listening to them in a cafe? Do you have them in your own positionality? Um, so there's those kinds of questions. There's also the um, the I, I think there's some other sets of questions that maybe are more specific to Palestine or to radio sets being sold in the Middle East, which may actually connect with um, air conditioning, actually, uh, in that so there's a there's a clear sense, um, and this is, you know, anecdotally when I've contacted like old advertising agencies and they've said, oh no, we never sold sets in the Middle East. <laughs> we never advertised for radio sets in the Middle East. And I'll say, no, I, you did. I've seen the ads <laughs> in the newspapers um, that uh, these markets weren't particularly large markets for the major, like the HMVs or the Philco's of the world. Um, but so then there was also along the way, these tech points that, again, I see primarily in ads of uh, which radio sets were built with the subtropical climate um, of um, Middle East use context in mind and which were not. Um, and so uh, you see kind of snippets along the way of advertisements talking about, well, our radio sets were actually, you know, intended to be used in this climate versus these other ones sold this other seller, which were imported, uh, but they were really intended to be used in a different set of, of climactic spaces. Um, and so that I don't have any, I've never seen a, a like a diary entry in which says, you know, oh, I brought a radio set that really should have been used in the Netherlands uh, rather than here. So I don't know how, how, how much that was a real thing, how much it was marketing, how much there's a whole set of like uh, cultural colonial assumptions built in, but it, it comes up anecdotally. Um, and so there's that, but then there's also the, um, those kind of wild images of like uh, this massive internal aerials uh, on the broadcasting side. Um, so they actually did require air conditioning and or people thought they required air conditioning. And so um, like when I look at the the um, diaries of the folks who used to be the administrators at their station, issues with the air conditioning comes up fairly frequently as a techni technological challenge. It's not really a mediation of a device, uh, but it's the idea of having created these set of devices to do this thing, to do this broadcasting thing, uh, and that also require some level of mechanical, also technological cooling to make that feasible. And so I think that's, uh, this is not a super precise answer, but I, I think that's a whole other element of mediation with device that the end user didn't really even not only see, but also didn't really hear uh, because it was invisible and in oral and just totally imperceptible to them. But it was a it was a thing. It was a going concern on, on the broadcasting side. Can I ask when those debates are from about their conditioning? Uh, so that's the 30s and the 40s. So they're not, uh, and, and um, so it, it's quite specific to the, the station broadcasting, right? So it's not like a thing that people typically had air conditioning. Although I, I would say that again, looking at um, like newspaper ads from the late 30s into the 40s, that there's a, there is kind of a swirling connectivity between the world of Ex travel experiences, which which is ships and airplanes, uh, and the world of more domestic, um, kind of self self consciously modern, um, maybe up middle to upper middle class experiences, which include radio sets, which include refrigerators, and which include air conditioning. Um, and so, <laughs> there is actually a way in which the three things that we're talking about, from my perspective, work really well together uh, for the kind of middle of the century, but in the case of air conditioning, where I see it, it comes in with broadcasting administrators talking about 
you know, oh, the air conditioning, need to manage the air conditioning. Oh, I need to talk to person X about the air conditioning because it's it's on the fritz again. That's a super interesting point and a wonderful connection, right? You know, 90 years ago. Um, yeah, the, um, you know, this reminds me, you know, like I'm sure Andrea knows, you know, like the rise of communication studies and modernization theory and all that stuff looked considered this idea of how uh, I think it was you know radio and other broadcasting is a kind of surrogate for uh, for for connection and and the the differences between uh, how people become more connected to places through 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 communications um, and how that supposedly you know uh, changes cultures um, in, in terms of the 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 you know devices I was just thinking about how travel you know used to be about documents. And have these material documents, and even the way airlines had to process fees and 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 split revenues was through a kind of system of, of paper documents. And so now, you know, you travel, and now more and more, there's been this, you know, you 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 have a device, and that becomes your your ticket. It also be you can also now travel, and and have a different experience. Um, um, you know, in the sense of you can tra you can track on your mobile. Uh, uh, you know, flight patterns and the weather, uh, um, and um, and have kind of information about about this experience in a way that you you sort of were more passive before, um, and, and and so I think you know uh, most people are watching movies or something on their phone, but you can also kind of use devices to interact with the system in a different way. Uh, before 9/11, there was this uh, beginning to be this effort to have contactless travel with with things like. You would have like some sort of um, a device uh, that you could, you know, pass through, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, pass through a system, and it's, and you have electronic passport and things like that. And I know in some places they're beginning to to develop these um, these kind of technologies with with various um, uh, I don't know if it's global access or other things. So they're they're beginning to 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 create a kind of mechanism where the where the traveler and their device becomes the sort of information and their their um, their ID and it kind of takes out uh, the human interaction, um, and, but it's all based on a kind of automated system with kind of surveillance and biometrics. So, I think these things kind of uh, go go with each other. That it seems easier and frictionless, but part of that's creating this like massive infrastructure of behind the scenes of of information and analytics. The same thing happens with you know who's going to get secondary screening or or uh, um, at the you know uh, EU frontier or um, at the Schengen frontier, you know there's like algorithms that are analyzing you know who gets their visa easily and who doesn't get their e visa easily. Um, so uh, you know I think some of the, the 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 shift towards you know the the devices makes it seem uh, more you know easy and frictionless, but at the same time that's that's based on a broader kind of infrastructure of kind of surveillance and monitoring. Hi, uh, I just want to jump in because I, I got a question um, from the chat anonymously. It was something we, we allow people to do. Uh, there was a question coming in from one of someone in our audience for Gokche um, asking about, uh, you know, did you notice uh, different perceptions of air conditioning and temperature in most our city uh, along gender lines? Like how, how is the perception of uh, air conditioning uh, gendered in that way? Uh at, at in the in the context of Mazdar city, uh, the gender issue didn't come up as much as the sort of the issue between sort of different nationalities and how different how people from different nationalities perceive uh, temperature. Uh, but I am aware that in uh, there is uh, quite a bit of literature on sort of um, uh, on on sort of gender divisions, and I guess the uh, the book I refer to, the sick building syndrome, also discusses the sort of the the, the, the sort of the again the gender divides in terms of inhabiting uh, buildings, and and there have been other uh, other kinds of divides as well. For instance, um, in uh, Catherine Pennell's book Last Project Standing, which is about public housing in Chicago, there's a sort of a a discussion of um, how um, how it's uh, heat and sort of uh, is is also sort of discussed along sort of racial divides so so i think we can find sort of uh, different instantiations of the sort of uh, how social difference is made known through uh, air conditioning 
again, in my case, it was more of a sort of a, in the case of Masdar, it was more of a sort of a divide between, um, um, between uh, Emirati and non-Emirati uh, sort of inhabitants of the building. But um, I wrote a, a, a very short piece for uh, the, um, for Ijmes about air conditioning. And, and in that piece, I included um, uh, sort of discussions from uh, recent sort of UAE newspapers about sort of conversations on air conditioning. And in those conversations, and it's sort of it's more of a sort of people submit complaints to the newspaper about sort of things they've experienced in their offices. And then, you know, there's a sort of a, a response from the newspaper or there's comments from other readers. So one in one of those, there was a sort of a text about a discussion about sort of, um, a, a sort of a, a woman being in an office who uses a blanket in order to sort of stay warm in the office environment, and then um, and then the read, sort of the suggestions are like, oh, in our, in our office we actually have a vote, and everyone votes, and we discuss what what the temperature should be, and so there is a conversation around sort of different kinds of systems that can be implemented in order to regulate uh, regulate uh, air. Um, and I and um, perhaps um, a little bit sort of expanding on that point, I think another sort of issue about mediation that we can talk about would be the um, would be sort of the formal uh, structures of the buildings and the design of the buildings in this context. So, and so and and um, uh, architecture scholar Jiat Hui Cheng talks about sort of the idea of thermal modernity. Again, I talk about that in the HMS piece, uh, where is a sort of a where there is a sort of emergence of air conditioning and and the implementation of air conditioning in buildings changes the relationship between the indoors and the outdoors and changes the sort of urban design patterns, and and therefore it's actually the sort of the um, the mediation that we experience through air conditioning is not only about the sort of indoor environment, but it is actually about both the sort of the, again, the sort of the architecture and the urbanism that uh, that people inhabit. So, um, I mean, I, um, in the sort of the q and I just, uh, very briefly talked about the sort of the, the, the sort of the global scale and how we can think about this in terms of climate change. But I guess maybe if you think about only the sort of the, sit, uh, the uh, space of a city, uh, we can also see how um, uh, the mediation of air uh, impacts uh, impacts life. Yeah, and maybe just to add to that, the thermal modernities, and coming back to what Andrea is saying with the, the kind of unseen cooling that had to happen at the radio station, what you just mentioned, Gokja, you know, what comes to mind are like the hotels in Beirut, right? Or within the larger Middle East, this kind of when Andrew's mentioning the 30s, the 40s, AC coming in, where did where where did AC go, right? The movie theaters, the hotels, certain types of places for certain types of people and activities. Um, Laith, it's all you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I have a question for uh, Walid and a question for Andrea. Um, Walid, this might be a little less relevant in the era of uh, aviation you're primarily interested in, but um, I'm wondering how you think the sort of the optic of the air or like the, the bird's eye view sort of more colloquially fits into how we understand the experience of flight. Um, the reason I bring it up is that I study Iraq in the interwar period and I keep coming across and I'm interested in how this unique value of bird's eye view seems to be shared between Royal Air Force bombers and air, air policemen, essentially, as well as archaeological survey photographers and air tourists as well. And it seems to be like the same thing they remark upon. Um, and Andrea, um, I wondered if you could, I know this was in your presentation a bit, but I want to hear more about the sort of cultural side of interwar broadcasting in your research. And this might be a bit too specific, but um, a bit selfishly, I'm interested as well if uh, you've come across sort of radio travel logs or other sorts of uh, mobility focused broadcasts because I found references to them um, primarily for American and British audience, but um, I'm just curious if that's something that's come up um, in your research. Thank you. Yeah, th I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And it's something I don't um, focus on directly, but have looked at. And in, a, in, in, in some ways, I'm kind of curious about how that experience of the 
the the the plane's eye view um you know first develops and what kind of imaginaries that that creates at the time because you do have you know and then you know like wendell wilkie traveling around the world in early 1940s or so um and kind of imagining that that now the world can be one that you know that that you can now you can cross differences and the differences between people are going to matter less or, or you get you get some imaginaries that sort of uh, uh um see see that like in a borderless world you know uh, but we also know that a lot of those imaginaries are kind of very deceptive um, and, and kind of erase the, 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 the territorial politics that still, you know, kind of matter in a lot of power is rooted, that the, that the, 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 the plains eye view becomes a, a vehicle for controlling territory. And, you know, the studies of rock and the role of air power and, and these kinds of things are surveying, surveying territory and managing territory, managing populations. So... You know, I, I kind of see that that history becomes the that that view, and rather than trying to trans realizing the transcendence of boundaries, becomes a vehicle for for controlling territory. And just to zoom today, today, you know, people don't see um, uh, people don't see territory so much through the airplane, but they see it through drones and they see it through satellite technology. Um, and so that's become the new kind of ocular um, that can uh, you know have and you, you find that, you know, just following the war in Ukraine is all about, you know, uh, satellite intelligence or the, the war in, in Syria to a certain degree, um, you know, uh, um, where we're seeing things, you know, through these kind of um, uh, more mechanical visions as opposed to the individual vision. So, you know, I'm not sure exactly what that, um, what that means, but I do think people, we, uh, you know, no longer kind of have that experience of seeing is seeing the earth from above it's much less part of the experience but they're used to seeing it through even when you're flying on certain airlines you'll get the camera that's looking down and so people will look at look through mediated through that camera rather than through their own kind of um uh, um, uh experience um and so you do get i'm sure you've seen there's um uh, it was much more so so van Boker book about a pilot you know in uh I don't know, up to the 50s, um, pilot, you would get like New Yorker articles by pilots. There's a series, maybe you've seen this in the New Yorker by a pilot who traveled through the Middle East, you know, about their experience and how they see the, see the place. And I'm kind of curious about these narratives of how do you know, what can you know from that point of view? But there is a literature of that time about people talking about seeing places from the air and somehow knowing them in a certain way. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting to, to, to look at and, and like what's going on in that way, because it's you're not looking um, you're you know, if you think about Edward Said's thing about distance and indifference, I mean, it's sort of like trying to transcend that, trying to say by transcending the, diff the distance, you can transcend the difference. But that's a little deceptive, I think, because it's it's, you know, um, uh, um, but I, I am kind of I do think that's kind of a curious era and how that did shape perspectives. So there's a lot there. So such a fun set of questions. Um, Leith, also, I know this wasn't your question for me, but the bird's eye view. So I can tell you that bird's eye view photos of radio transmitters are not successful. Um, I actually did, there's also one in that, in the series that I was talking about, or it's not exactly in that series. I'm so curious, but like, why were they up in the air? What else were they photographing? But anyway, they photographed the, um, the, the transmitting uh, 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 buildings and the, and the aerials in Ramallah and it's it's not pretty it's not a success it doesn't have that like iconic architecturality of <clears throat> of photographing the transmitters from the ground so that was not a successful uh photograph photograph approach um but in terms of the cultural side of broadcasting so I actually I really love talking about this um <clears throat> and I've been focusing more in my own work on the BBC's Arabic service more recently I'm looking at the first couple of decades of their work as well and they're very uh curiously and also very interestingly involved in uh, particularly developing radio plays um but also in in poetry competitions um but uh the I'll have to maybe we could email offline because I, I can't find the thing that I'm looking for on my laptop. Um, but uh, one of their, like the BBC's Arabic service was uh, not particularly successful when it started. Um, uh, but the thing that was successful, um, surprising to everybody, was this um, 
set of like English by radio uh, kind of uh, lessons that they did online. Um, and one of the kind of, uh, I don't know, upper level series, that they did different iterations of it over the years and they expanded into other languages. Um, so uh, it, it has a longer history of its own, but there's a, there is a radio travelogue and it's, it's designed as an English language learning travelogue and I can't remember the guy's name but he travels like I think it's generically from Egypt but he travels to England and so and he visits a friend who's also an Arabic speaker in England and so it's uh it's kind of tagged in and they they go you know they look at villages and they look at London and they look at industry and they do these other things um so it, it is a it is a radio travelogue um but it also has this other well it has this um like imperial purpose of you know explaining England <laughs> Uh, to listeners, but it also has this pedagogic purpose of uh, kind of um, connecting people across multiple languages. So um, that's that's the main one. And I, I have all kinds of archival stuff on that if you'd be interested. So I'd be happy to chat about that further. But it is the the cultural and entertainment side of of radio in terms of the what was on air for most of the time that any station was on air. It really is that that kind of programming and uh and yet because so much of the history of radio has been focused on propaganda particularly in the mid-century because it overlaps with the world war world war ii and then the cold war um the uh the news broadcasting um has really taken kind of the the primary focus of a lot of the older scholarship great thank you Leith. um other questions from the audience? Feel free to send them in chat to uh, Jim or I, or raise your hand. We're happy to bring you into the conversation. And maybe just while we're waiting for that, um, the panelists, any comments, questions of your fellow panelists, their projects, other connections. I, I think Andrea and, and Gokche, two of the things you guys brought up um, amongst what kind of came up here were, were really interesting connections that I hadn't even um, seen. I mean, I guess I have a methodological question for, uh, for all of us, which is about how, how do you study air? Um, because in some ways, I think maybe this is what the a panel was meant to foreground as well, that it's maybe you can only study air through its mediations and through its uh, sort of, uh, uh, and that, that's why here we're talking about air conditioning and radio and airplanes and not about maybe air itself. So I'm, I'm just curious to see if, uh, any one of you has brainstormed about the sort of the, especially after receiving the prompt from uh, Jared and Jim um, about whether it's sort of how to think with air or about air in a um, in other ways that are not through the kinds of technologies that either regulate or occupy or sort of um, uh, rely on air. So, you know, it's a great question. And, you know, I might just add a, a point, the, uh, the, the quote that was in the abstract, and I, and I mentioned it again at the beginning from Tim Ingold, who's an anthropologist who really works between architecture, art, anthropology. Um, and I think in the same work, and I'll try to put it in the chat, he continues kind of ruminating about uh, well, lots of things, but he, I think there's this one point where he says, you know, the, you don't hear the wind until it touches something, right? Like the wind doesn't have, um, it doesn't reverberate until it touches something. And that touch on something is what we hear. And so your question kind of come, uh, brings to mind just um, the ubiquitousness of air and then the, the, the transfer points, the vectors, the, the contacts that um, in those interceptions, maybe those are, you know, where the social dynamics kind of uh, emerge in some way. And uh, so, so I, I am, I have been the director of undergraduate studies for the past few years. And so uh, one of my jobs as part of that is to um, sort of uh, guide uh, our seniors, right, their senior thesis. And, and one of our senior th uh, 
students now is actually writing a project on sort of the visible how air is made visible through smog uh, mm. and so so in some sense it is a sort of the uh, the, the way in which um, air differentiates itself maybe uh, and becomes perceptible through that um, and yeah I don't know it's I think it is a it is a, it is a it is a challenge but an interesting challenge for sure I would say too, just to, sorry to jump in here, but uh, I would send people back to the first air session that we did in the fall with uh, Asher Gertner, who had a fantastic uh, presentation on air pollution uh, and a, a lot of the, the work around that. I mean, it, it seems to be a little bit the, the methodological stake you're throwing down here as well. What is air and what is it composed of and how do we study that methodologically differently than the way we study uh, its mediations and that sort of thing. So we can put a link to the chat to that. Uh, awesome discussion and also i should mention i mean goksha your work came up i think in that in the midst of that discussion <laughs> it was a big uh you know uh one of the wonderful things about this series is how exactly you know each of the the panels is kind of connected to each other uh in their own citations in that way so uh i want to want to thank you for being here with us <laughs> and that thing, as well as uh we'll leave an andrew i was gonna say i actually this is a really again this is a super fun enterprise to be part of, uh, in part because I tend to think of myself as working more on sound. And so I don't think of it as like, oh, but there's air. That was really interesting. Um, and so uh, I don't know that I have a super helpful answer other than it does seem to be something that's a bit evasive, at least in terms of um, radio more than recorded sound. People talk about, you know, being on air, right? On air, off air, uh, the kind of magic of hearing things through air in a way that isn't really discussed with recorded sound. And yet like <laughs> so few people have any idea how it actually works, right? So in some ways it's like a lovely precursor to the uh, many technologies of today that people inhabit and engage with, with comfortable levels of ignorance on how they actually work, right? Um, and so um, I don't know, um, I, it might be that it is very possible uh, to study air itself um, in a particular discipline. Um, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm not sure that I'm super disappointed for myself in in studying the mediations um, and maybe studying the interplay between the the air or the you know air and the waves, the different kinds of waves going through it uh, and and their interaction. But I really appreciate that question. It's very thoughtful. It, you know, it makes me think that one of the things I mean that we or at least you know I study is probably it's probably about distance more than it is about air. Because it's about the you know how to get, get uh, um, 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 uh, connect distances, um, and that air is the the means to connect distances in the same way that radio is also a, a way to you know connect across distances. Um, but the thing I get from uh, and, and reading this book, Skyfaring talks about much of the medium of air for you know for flight is actually water or clouds or weather, uh, um, you know, or temperature. Which is air, but it's you know affected by um, by things that change temperature, which could be the sun and different forms of energy. So you start thinking about you know, um, and then I, I had a slight interest in the early development of aviation in the Middle East, looking at how what what enabled it was uh, uh, weather weather uh, analysis and prediction. So one thing that the U.S. Army first did when it was setting up airports in the Middle East was develop. Uh, capabilities in terms of weather prediction, and this is something that that the first airports that were you know uh, um, that were developed needed to know how to do and learn to do. Um, so so the realizing so I start thinking about how much of it's it's the it's uh, um, um, it's not just about distance, but it was earlier on it was really important to think about all those things that are in the air because that's what needed to be um, uh, um, you know um, navigated to enable air travel was navigating the weather navigating um in you know in darkness uh, um and so some of that related to radio and, and other things um uh, like that so yeah that's an interesting way to to think about it and then also the idea of things like turbulence and things like these you know that are part of the experience of air travel is really about where you, re, you where, where you experience the air you know um and and some of that's because it's you know coming up against the your 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 machine um and and so that's that often um 
yeah, it doesn't, doesn't come in the analysis, but it's important to think about, especially in an earlier phase. I think to the degree that people don't, real, don't, don't experience or feel that they're going through the air is, is, is something that's maybe part of the current experience. But if you go through the history of it, it was much more important in the earlier phases. And then the, the, experience, the, 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 the effort of the experience to commercialize it was to try to sort of insulate it from that experience. That's great. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. If there is another question from the audience, there um, we're trying to keep up uh, with some of the references, just throwing them in. And thank you to anybody else who's also adding to that. I guess, I, I, I mean, to follow up on the discussion that's happening here and now, I mean, I guess my, another question might be then the difference between what atmosphere and air, uh, because so, sometimes I think um, we tend to sort of uh, treat those as being the same same thing. Uh, but but I wonder again, again, this is to sort of uh, um, add to the sort of the earlier methodological question if there is a methodological difference between studying atmospheres and air or if there is a certain or because in some ways again we could think of all three of our presentations as about being atmosphere as well uh, and I, I I don't know if this would um, um, I mean, generate a different kind of perspective on our or on our projects than if we didn't see them as being about air, but about being about the atmosphere instead. Um, Goche, one thing that comes to mind, at least with my own work, which deals with weather and atmosphere related to tourism in, in Lebanon, is you know when you look at let's say any kind of basic science whether is this the relationship of heat and water and air and so it's interesting then to kind of take your prompt and think about the air as a space where these dynamics might happen but the atmosphere being the exchange of energy um, and the relationship between changing dynamics and so i think like it's actually an, an interesting question of maybe expanding the scope of the panel because really what we are talking about and what we've asked you guys to talk about in each of your projects is something that's a little bit more entangled of these dynamics of these um, exchanges of energy and otherwise I actually thought you meant atmosphere as a metaphor. Um, and so, and that sounded amazing. Although this also sounds quite amazing, like actual physical atmosphere also sounds amazing, just a bit different. Um, uh, but if we were gonna go with the, my error of atmosphere as a metaphor, um, I was also thinking that like that actually would work really well for things like programming or the 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 listening spaces, right? So listening in a family context, listening in an individual context, in a work context, um, or listening uh, again like to recorded music or to broadcast things. But I bet I see lots of um, <clears throat> descriptions in people's memoirs of not having a gramophone or a radio, and so standing outside somebody else's shop or house in order to listen and or just being glad that the walls were thin enough <clears throat> that they could hear what was playing in in this the the place next door where someone did have that and so from an atmospheric perspective uh from a metaphorical atmospheric perspective i think there actually is quite a lot to be done uh in terms of thinking about the cultural and, and societal uh kind of listening uh <clears throat> spaces and ambiances that are <laughs> connected but I, I recognize that that was me misinterpreting uh your no question, so. No, not no, not at all. To jump back in, I mean, I think I'm, I'm talking about the science as like a way that we can maybe deploy the metaphor, but it's actually like that hawa zhao. Like you walk in and like there's just like the what's the energy in this room? It's off, or you know that affective, emotional, the sensibilities that are transferred through this medium. And so you did not misinterpret. Maybe I just wasn't clear enough. So, uh, Waleed, did you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, I was thinking about air and actually sound, like in the sense without atmosphere, you couldn't have sound. Um, and, the, you know, 
uh, thinking about how that, because uh, I think about this more in terms of the, the limits of space um, and how we start realizing these projects are very terrestrial in the sense that, um, you know, and, 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 um, uh, um, and so they're, they're confined to a particular kind of atmosphere. Um, and, and, uh, and so if you start thinking about, you know, travel beyond the atmosphere in this, you know, like how do we start thinking about things kind of differently? Um, but then let me bring it back to climate change, because if we're thinking about the atmosphere, um, the climate aspect is part of it. So, you know, I think we, I mean, that's what I've been, uh, it's not what I study, but it's like, I, you can't avoid it if you're thinking about, you know, anything relating to the atmosphere or energy or transportation. Um, and so the, the, the fact that there is, the fact that it's not just this invisible medium, the fact that it is this material thing, the atmosphere that has temperature um, and, and affects climate change um, is, you know, I don't know, is, is so essential to, you know, thinking about all social sciences these days. So I don't know, I don't have an answer to that, but that's what I started thinking about. When I think about atmosphere, uh, that, that's where it really seems to matter the most. Thank you. So, you know, we're coming up on two. We are going to break out of the Hollywood squares. We will end the recording.